Um, it is not upside down. Tonight, we are going to look at aerobatics. Why? Some basic maneuvers. We'll just look at things that you would expect an aircraft can do. We'll look at what kind of aircraft we need to do aerobatics. We'll look at advanced maneuvers that we can do. About the captain and a bit more. Now, why on earth would someone go to the aerobatics when it's already dangerous to fly an aircraft? Like you couldn't Safer than jumping out. Well, we're all here. Well, you have to think that, suppose you're the first person who flies an aircraft and you're talking all around, you're proud of yourself, you're the first man alive to be in the air, and then all of a sudden, poof, 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 and you try to recover, you've just invented aerobatics. In fact, if you think about it, for the last 20,000 years, the only way of flying used to be aerobatics, it's just that nobody recovered out of it until <laughs> they've actually flown for the first time. Aerobatic was actually invented before flying. It's only when we started to fly that we could recover out of aerobatics. It began with uh, aerobatic used to be just a survival skills. They had aircraft that were so marginal because they knew nothing about aer aerodynamics that even on a normal flight, the aircraft would go into all sorts of crazy maneuvers that they had to recover. And only the people who could recover actually survived. Now, once they've done it a couple of times, they got comfortable with this. Oh, well, why don't we do it again? And then it became after that just for the fun of it. Why don't we take an aircraft and we do a loop? That would be interesting for everyone. So there's about 20 people that did it, and they all die one after the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Until they understood what, what was making the loop working and not working, and then someone finally discovered how it works, and then everybody's doing it today. Well, sort of. And in the army, during military times, they realized that the people who could do aerobatics were surviving the fight. So at the beginning, the army was very conservative, and they were saying, do not fly aerobatics maneuver with the aircraft, until they realized that the cowboys on aircraft were coming back alive, because nobody could catch up with them. So they've actually developed aerobatics for fighter pilots to, in order to get away from the fight. And I was going to give you a definition of aerobatics, but if you look in the dictionary, it says uh, something nice to see your majesty for a demonstration. And if you go into the actual documentation of the government, aerobatics is like more than 60 degrees in uh, in the bank of an aircraft, more than so many Gs and all that. Basically, aerobatics between you and I is something that you wouldn't do normally when you just fly from A to B. You do it because it's different, because it feels different and it's a bit more sport than seeing you not long. So that's why we have aerobatics. So why why am I doing aerobatics? Yeah, I know, a bit crazy, but me too got <coughs> very excited flying in a training area, like everybody who starts flying. I got really, really excited by the board. The thing that aerobatics is giving you is more skills. Aerobatics will bring you to the total envelope of the aircraft, not only the normal flight of the aircraft. You will discover the limit of the aircraft, you will understand the aerodynamics of the aircraft, otherwise you're not coming back. I didn't fly for nine years, Connie decided to do a license, no way I was going to just sit on a tarmac wait for her, playing around for a couple of years, so I wanted to learn a bit more, so I decided to, to go there. The other thing too is, I didn't fly for nine years. I went back to a school. I've flown three times with them, and it's not, long, it's not a lot. Like, after nine years, you don't fly, and then the, I went up three times, and stand the license, and you can fly again. And I wasn't comfortable with the skills that I had. Like, yes, I could bring an aircraft to somewhere, but what if something happened in between? Will I have the reflex? By going through a formal aerobatic training, I had to go through a lot of extensive training, and then I got my confidence back with this. It's a lot of pleasure doing aerobatics. If you're going out for an hour, or if you're doing navigation and you fly for three hours, it becomes a bit boring. If you go from here to double, the flight will take two hours. Two hours. It's uh, pretty much from batteries to double, it's a straight line of uh, an engine going at about 2400 RPM. There's trees, there's roads, there's some waterways, there's, but you know, it, 
while aerobatics, you go out for about half an hour, an hour, and when you come back, you're there for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and aviation is like a bit like amateur radio. There is something for any for everyone. There are amateur radio that have never operated a radio. There are amateur radio that are never on the air. We've met expert of aerials that design aerial. It's things incredible. They can talk to the moon. They never they are never on the air because. In the amateur radio field, there's a lot of things that you can do. It's exactly the same thing. A lot of people, there are people who are for aerobatics that don't even have a license to go from uh, uh, Bankstown to Camden. They're not allowed to land it. They still have the restricted training area license, and they are very, very high in the aerobatics. They do a lot of competition, because what they like is to take an aircraft to do funny things with it. We are going to look at three basic maneuvers, and I will show at the same time on the video that Richard has taken. We've been a couple of times in the aircraft. We'll explain why, and uh, we'll explain how they work and all that. The thing that you have to remember when you look at an aircraft, if you see a movie and you see aircraft going a doing aerobatics, is what you usually see is the outside view. You are someone seeing it from the outside, seeing a look of something. What we're going to see today is from the inside how it looks like. It is not the same thing, believe me. And it doesn't feel the same thing either. So the first one that everybody will understand, I think it's, it's, a, I think it's going to be easy. If I have a little aircraft to show you. <laughs> it's a night, night I wish you could. Yeah, yeah. night I yeah. Slow the lens. <laughs> the shades are over, the colors are over. John, look at that. Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah and finally ending at the bottom. Now, this is the basic loop. You can do it the other way around. You can do it from the top to the bottom. So there's all sort of way of doing it. The basic one, the one that everybody learns on, is just to do a very simple roll like this. The thing that you have to realize is when you pull at the bottom of the loop and you start climbing, you are going to pull a 4G in. 4G is like if you had three people of your size sitting on yourself, on your lap, and also leaning on your head and all that. So that's how it's going to feel. And um, if you can look at Richard, I would like Richard to demonstrate how a 4G force feels like. All right. um, <laughs> on the face of the stomach, right? <laughs> yeah, um, a good way to get the feel is just to rest, rest your hands on, on your cheeks and just you know, let your arms hang loose. Because it does feel like your, your cheeks are coming up. And I, I really regret that I didn't turn the camera around and look at my own face, just to see where my, where my cheeks down around my chest. <laughs> and the reason comes. why we had to do it twice, the video, we had to do two sorties, is Richard wasn't used to the G-forces. So what happened is every time there was a bit of G-forces <coughs> in the aircraft, the camera just goes into that. <laughs> so the second time, Richard actually put his elbow in his stomach to make sure that the camera doesn't move. So we have a video here where we're going to see He's just as good in the plane, too. <clears throat> okay, now the first view will be from in front of the aircraft. It's a bit difficult to follow because the only thing you see is sky and then you see the ground. So that's the dash, that's the canopy in front of you. And we're diving a bit to get a bit of speed, 170 knots. And then we go up. Then you see a sky. We're going to be upside down so you'll see the horizon coming up. And then we have the vertical dive and the pull from the bottom of the dive. 
Now, as you're upside down, you still have about 1G, it's pulling up. Not down, obviously. So you're still sitting on the C. There's no negative Gs in this uh, maneuver at all. Now, we're going to see it again with the camera looking at the wingtip. And then we'll see the dive. You see there's an angle as soon as we dive. And then there's a climb. And then I'm looking, I'm looking for the horizon because I'm going to keep the aircraft level. We are upside down. And here's the vertical dive. And then we're back straight and level. Yes? What's the diameter of a loop like that? Well, this is a, uh, that's a wing over. We're just turning back to where we were. Because the thing is, we're burning ground at that kind of speed, so we have to... It depends on the aircraft. Faster is the aircraft, more you'll take. Uh, we go up about 700 feet, so it's about 700 feet. And that should stop here. Yep. Could you keep it going upside down? Uh, yes, then you you will be going into inverted fly, which yeah. we'll talk about in the advanced manual. Right. So at the moment, <coughs> what you do is you have a lot of speed, which is a lot of kinetic energy that you transform into potential energy. So the aircraft is pretty slow upside down, and then the speed build up again, and then you get back your kinetic energy. And usually with a normal loop, you don't lose altitude. You get back to the level where you are, but pretty much. Very much. <coughs> the thing you have to remember, you get about 4G here and you get about 1G all along. You will not go below 1G. You won't get any negative G if it's well done. Now, the way it is done from the stick is you pull on the stick and you keep a constant angle of attack. The stick is not moving. You get your climbing altitude, altitude and you just hold it and then it will go around and around. When you get at the bottom, you just release on the stick and it's finished. It's very easy to do. That's the first one. Tank, <laughs> the second one that we learned, well, we learned these, it doesn't matter in which order, but the second most popular one is to do a roll. A roll is that you just do this. Now, there's a million a way of doing it. There's also there's the slow one, which is very, very complex. We'll see later on. And the, the easy one is just, it's a quick one. You just send the stick on one side and the aircraft goes like this. The only problem is the aircraft is going to lose at altitude because you don't have the same lift. So what you do is before that is you actually raise the nose, check the controls, so you let the aircraft fall a bit, and then you just uh, put the stick either way. They usually go either way, and then the aircraft will go this way. Now, depending on props and also the property of the aircraft will roll faster on one side than the other. So the next video will show you the roll, and again we'll see it from the front of the cockpit and cockpit and the end of the cockpit. The, sorry, the wing tip. <coughs> So I'm explaining to Richard that I'll be pulling so that he knows what to expect. Have you got the volume down because of Richard screaming? <laughs> We're upside down and getting back. We tried to tap the uh, video to the uh, intercom, but uh, we had a resistance problem. And you'll see the pull very well from the wind tip. There's a pull, and then we turn. Okay. Yeah, you actually got quite a big angle there, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Mm. And if you can see it from the outside, the aircraft actually does something like this. It actually climbs. So that is a roll. And the barrel roll is a combination of the two together. You actually do a loop and a roll at the same time. This is the nicest aerobatic maneuver from sitting on the seat. You get between 1 and 2 G max. There's no side effect like the, the roll. There's no big major um, G forces and you don't
go upside down the same way. And this one, what happened is you climb, and as you roll, you also do a loop at the same time. So if you had a cylinder here, you could see that the aircraft is actually flying around a cylinder. That's why they call it a barrel. And this one you learn later because it's a bit harder to understand what's happening. And before I knew that, I used to bring people in and do all sorts of things but that, and people would get sick quite fast. If you start with this, people don't even realize. You can close your eyes and you'll just feel like something's happening, but you won't know you went around. And this one is a really nice one for introduction the first time you go. And this is what we're going to see now. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, we've actually dived into the ground a bit more than the previous one. And that's it. There's no G-forces. It's quite comfortable. So if you go with someone, I'll just let this one finish. I think it's the next one is only a wing over. A wing over is a military maneuver that allows you to change direction 180 degrees just by going back to where you're coming from. Is it like the fastest way to turn around, is it? Yeah, it's, it's not really an aerobatic maneuver. It's, uh, you could do that with any aircraft. It is the fastest way to do a 180 degree turn right. and to get back to... Uh, <coughs> and I'll just explain quickly how we, what the property of that turn is. You've actually transformed your speed into a high gain. And by the time the aircraft slows down, you, you do the turn, mm -hmm. which is done quickly, an aircraft will turn a lot quicker. Well, it's like with your car. If you, do, you can't do a U-turn at 120 kilometers per hour. The car won't do it. So when the aircraft slows down, you turn around, and then you get back your speed by diving. Right. And there's all sorts of plane altitude. If you're higher than the enemy that you want to follow, you'll be able to use this gain of altitude to transform into speed and catch up with them. And uh, so that's another maneuver, but it's not really aerobatics, you can do it with any aircraft. Is that called a chandelle as well? No, the chandelle is when you finish, you are at the top and at low speed and you stay at the top. So the chandelle is really a climb as well as a turn. And the chandelle is an American term, there's, there's a lot of differences between how American do aerobatics and how English do it of European countries and they have different names for different things and different way of but it's all fun anyway. Now we're going to look at what kind of aircraft we use to do aerobatics. What do you think would be the consideration, not from the pilot, but <laughs> consideration you have to think about when you want to do aerobatics with an aircraft? Good Anybody? insurance I guess. Uh, <laughs> oh, wings fall off. I've never checked that. <coughs> Anything else that you can think of related to aircraft? Yeah? But will the airframe handle it? Yeah, okay, that's a good one. The uh, aircraft will have a lot more G-forces than uh, if you just do normal traveling. Yeah? Anything else that you can think of right away? Carburation. Fuel pickup. Yeah, fuel is one. Carburation. Carburation, yeah, fuel again, yeah. There's more. Yeah. Maneuverability? Overall, Sorry? Overall maneuverability. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. if we look at the main things really, the first one is the tr strength. A, a, a small aircraft usually can cope to about 4 Gs, that's the limit. It's 3.8 G, the regulation, they all mm -hmm. go for 50% more than that, but they are registered at 3.4 Gs. Uh, this aircraft we're flying in, the Mark T that you have there, so you have it's a Ferrari, it's a, an Italian aircraft. Uh, it's about 30 years old, you can still buy them today. It was probably 25 years in advance at the time. And this particular one is 30 years old. That's the only one in Australia. And there's quite a few in the country. They use that as a military scre uh, screener to see who could do military training or not. In this few countries, you can actually buy the guns and that goes under that. Uh, so. An aircraft like this will do about, it's rated at plus 8G and minus 4 or 5, I think. 
So already it's more than double. And a lot of aerobatic aircraft goes to plus 10 or minus 10. So you have to remember that when you do a 4G pull, it's like if you take your Falcon and you put three other Falcon on the top and you drive around and it's still drivable. And everybody, everybody knows that if you put six people on a Falcon with a full load in the, at the back, the car is almost on the ground. So the aircraft has to be a lot more rigid. That's the first thing we have to look at. The second thing is related to the control. The controls of the aircraft will offer more deflection. So when you roll, the aileron will, will be bigger, will have more um, control direction. The rudder will be bigger too because you, will, you use a lot of the rudder on the aerobatic aircraft. Engine system, well, if you do only positive G maneuvers, like the one we saw, it doesn't matter. And if you happen to do a loop and it goes into a negative G, you will just, the, the engine will maybe stop. And as soon as you go back, the carburetor will get the fuel and everything. So it should be okay. But things that you have to think about the engine is, like, like a car, an engine will have an oil um, sound. sound. If you go upside down, or if the aircraft think you're upside down, you need negative G, well, there's no more oil in the sound. The oil will rush at the bottom of the engine. Mm -hmm. So what they usually do is, on the, at the top of the engine where there's a breather for the oil, there's a cap that will take any oil going out when it's upside down, and as soon as you put the aircraft back erect, the oil will drip back in the engine. So it works. Uh, usually come back to put a boil under the aircraft and you have to put another liter in it, but uh, it's, it's, it's so <laughs> I mean, it's limited. It, it, it's retained the oil. The other thing that you have to realize with the oil, too, is that the, the, oil, the pump won't work anymore because the pump is trying to get the oil from the, the sump at the bottom. So what they do with aircraft that will fly upside down, or inverted fly, they actually have either a double sump, or they have a, a pumping system where the oil is not kept in the engine, it just goes somewhere else where it's uh, repressurized in the engine. Fuel system is also com very complex. In the old time, we used to have a double carburetor, so the carburetor could work both sides. Today, they use fuel injection. They don't have the problem, but you have to be able to get the fuel out of the, the tank. So most of the tank usually take the fuel from the bottom. Well, if you're upside down, there's no more fuel. So there's there's multiple ways of doing it. The obvious one is to have two pickups, but it's quite complex because you get air in the system. The most current way, or the most usual way to do it, or the simpler one, is they also have a small tank which is meant to work the other way around. And then they take the fuel from this one as well and from this one. And what happens is when you fly Eric, it takes the fuel from this one. And when you fly inverted flight, it will take the fuel from the small one. The small one lasts between 2 minutes and 10 minutes, depending on the size and you have to remember how long you've been upside down and as you come back here, this tank will refill from the main tank so there is they say well the decathlon at the club where we fly you go two minutes upside down and you need one minute on the red flight to get this little res reservoir refilled with the fuel so in your maneuvers if you do these kind of maneuvers you have to plan your sequence that you will be refueling this one so that you can fly again upside down. Other features, there's quite a few other things that we have to consider. Uh, a stick rather than a steering wheel, so uh, it's easier to control. There's... What is it easier? With the stick, you can remember where the positions are more easily. Your arms is able to measure and reproduce the same thing. Well, if you have the wheel, it's harder. Why they have a wheel and all the aircraft? Because they don't, they don't do aerobatics. I mean, this. So it's, it's easier for aerobatics, but not for general flying. Is that what you're saying? The problem with general flying with a stick is the stick is at the wrong place. It's where you want to put your your menu, you know, your, <laughs> <laughs> your sandwiches. No, it's also where you have your maps. Oh, yeah, and maps. Your, yeah. 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 It, it's very awkward to, to go with a stick when you have a map or a clipboard. It's very difficult. So, for also consideration, the, the, the wheel is better for touring, 
But as soon as you are bush pilot, you know, or as soon as you do aerobatics, uh, people will prefer stick. Now the, the trend is to have the stick in the wall. Even the new big aircraft, Airbus, the new Airbus, they have the stick on the wall. So it's not between your leg and uh, it's on the side. The other features that you have, well, that you will see on aerobatic aircraft, biplane. A lot of biplanes, if not all the biplanes, are aerobatics. Why are they becoming, why are they better aerobatic aircraft than normal aircraft? Is that if you cut the wings in half and you put them double, you have less inertia when it's going to roll. The other thing, too, is instead of having two ailerons, you have four of them. So when you turn the stick, it, it actually turns quicker. Like you do two rolls, for the time you'll do one roll in an aircraft like this. The other thing that you will have is symmetry. Most of the aircraft are made that they fly very well this way. If you fly them inverted, you will have to fly them that way to get some lift up. And they're not very efficient. Aerobatic aircrafts, the real aerobatic aircraft, have symmetric wings so that there's no difference if you're upside down or not. If you see a bit special, they actually, some people put wheels on both sides and they actually land the aircraft upside down. <laughs> it's part of the demonstration. It, it, it makes sense in, for these kind of maneuvers. The other symmetry too that you'll see is most of the aircraft, because of the prop is turning on one, in one direction, they will actually bend the tail. And they bend the tail so that at cruising speed, the aircraft goes straight without any correction. But at any other speed at a cruising speed, you need to do some correction with the rudder. If you do that with an aerobatic aircraft, it's causing also a parasite situation that you have to correct all the time. So with an aerobatic aircraft, it will make it symmetric. And then as you, if you fly for a cruise, you would have to adjust the rudder for the crew. The people who buy an aerobatic aircraft, they don't usually cruise with it. Uh, they go to a competition, you know, they fly two competitions, but in general, they want an aircraft that performs in aerobatic maneuvers. Weight distribution, fuel tank on the body. So that when it's time to do a roll, when it's time to do a spin, you don't have weight at the extremities of the aircraft. In fact, most of the aerobatic aircraft, you are sitting on the fuel tank. So if you're not very comfortable with flying aerobatics upside down and all that, if you fly a Robin, which is a very popular trainer, you're actually sitting on the, uh, the fuel tank. Constant speed propeller. You've probably all heard that aircraft has good aircraft or more expensive aircraft will have a variable pitch problem. Well, the variable pitch prop has been thrown in the bin just after the first war. They don't exist anymore. It's very, very rare. These were the one where you had a stick and you could actually change the pitch a bit like you change a gear in a car. They don't use that anymore. What they use, they call them constant speed prop. The pitch will change, but it's driven by governor to keep the same RPM all the time. So what you do is you set the RPM on the prop, and you never know if the prop is fine or coarse. The prop will always adjust so that the prop keep going at the same speed. The reason why it's good with aerobatics is when you do a vertical dive with an aircraft that doesn't have a constant speed prop, you actually have to retard the throttle which is giving you one more thing to check in the aircraft every time you do something to make sure you don't overspeed the engine. If you have a constant speed prop, the prop will go full fine, will start to act as a brake, and then the prop will stay at the, the RPM that you set. Very, very important, very, very practical. Also, constant speed prop are a lot more efficient because when you need them to be fine, they will be fine. If you need a lot of power at low speed, they'll be very fine. If you need a lot of speed, then they'll get coarse. But you don't set the prop uh, setting the, the actual final pitch. The pitch, thank you. Okay, the... I'll show you a video, but I'll show you something else to, that you can pass around. Is This aircraft that you see there was, or is a an aerobatic aircraft, but it's not a very good aerobatic aircraft. Too fast, there's fuel all over these things at the end. They are fuel uh, reservoir. They, um, it's, uh, the rudder is not big enough. For We don't have enough rudder authority, so there's a lot of maneuvers where it's a bit hard to get right, so you, do, you need a lot more practice. And 
I have a picture here, and it's better if you look at it upside down. This is someone doing a barrel roll with a 707. <laughs> and this is actually a boy in the company where the guy asked one of his test pilots, I'm having a barbecue, or well, it's a big barbecue, but, and I want you to do a demonstration and come with a 707 because I want to sell it to the world, and I want you to just fly around. And the guy came in and did a barrel roll with a 707. <laughs> and uh, apparently they've done that with B-52s, with 747, but you don't hear about it because they're not supposed to, but they do it. <laughs> and it's quite easy to do aerobatics with aircraft that are not aerobatics, but what do you think would be the problem? Suppose you respect the, the limit and you do only positive G, so the aircraft never knows that it is actually upside down, the fuel system, hydraulic system. What could be the problem of doing aerobatics with aircraft that are not, even if you're safe? Anyone? Well, the bits that aren't tied down, or, uh, no, positive G. No. The aircraft wouldn't know. There is one <coughs> thing that you have to think about. If ever you get an aircraft with a friend who wants to do that, what if something goes wrong? You will not be able to recover because the aircraft doesn't have the control authority to do it or the strength. You can be doing something. We, I was reading about expert. You know, people that run all the competitions, they do one of the maneuver every time, and one time for no reason, it, the maneuver turned into a spin, they had to get out of spin, try to get a 707 out of the spin, <coughs> and uh, you might have a party. So if you want to, just look at this, and what I'm going to show you is a, a video of, can you give me the blue one? This is a retired man that has been hired by a company called Rockwell, where they make an aircraft called Commander, that they wanted to demonstrate that the aircraft was really strong, and they asked him to do a, a bit of an aerobatic display. The guy, oh, the guy is about 70 years old, and he's doing aerobatics in a utility aircraft. Okay, if you can look now, this is a big twin. Yeah. Yeah, the guy's in his 70s. And you see the from the inside, that's a nice barrel roll from the outside. And then he's going to get the gear in, stop the engine. He's stopping the engine now. And he's going to do a loop and go down almost to the runway. But that's a... Um, and uh, restarting the engine. So if you go through this video, there's, you'll find a few sequences that he's doing. And the reason why I'm showing you that is just to show you that you could do aerobatics without a cut of aircraft and the one that was designed for that. You just have to be pretty sure what you're doing. Now this guy is marginal, he's doing it, he's touching the ground while doing his aerobatic maneuver. When we do it, we never go below three and a half thousand feet. So if something goes wrong with us, <coughs> at three and a half thousand feet, we have three and a half thousand feet to find a way to get out of it. Half a half a mirror. Another one to stay up there, something went wrong. Is this the one? Is that the one where the tower clears somebody onto the runway as he's on final? Just put it back in and back it out. That's, that's Hoover, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think this one's stuck too. Yeah. I don't know whether it's in that, that video, but he does these... <laughs> he does these manoeuvres at, at air shows all over the place. And there was an air show where they had the same sort of footage and he's he's come down across the runway, cut the engines, done a loop at the other end and then come back to land and the tower cleared a plane onto the runway. The plane come out on the runway and he's he's coming down on final, no engines, about to land, and he, he made some comment to the tower about 
come on you guys, get this plane out of the way or because the tower obviously forgot that he was there. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't done for the video, that was accidental. Oh, that was accidental. Okay. Okay. But he was all quite calm about it. So sorry for the video, I won't be able to use it for the next one. But <coughs> Okay, now we've looked at what kind of aircraft we need, we'll look at advanced maneuvers. Now the next one is the most interesting one. We, it's a bit hard to see on the video, but I don't want to risk to put the video again. Before we look, sorry, that's the next one I want to show you, that is a very interesting one. Before we look at interesting maneuvers, we'll have to look what happened with mishandling. I mean, I'm learning, I'm new to it, I'm going to do mistakes. So one of the things you learn is for each maneuver, you learn how to get out of it if it goes wrong. So they also tell you how it's going to go wrong. And guess what? The first time you do it, it goes wrong. They let you see if you can get out of it. The typical one with the loop is, you I'm not sure if you know, but when you fly an aircraft, if you're climbing, it's actually hard on the stick. And then you have to trim it until you get not, uh, neutral again. So when you do a loop, the 4G, you actually feel it on the stick. You really have to pull. By the time you get there, you get less than, well, you have about 1G or a bit less, so the stick is pretty easy. So what you tend to do the first time you do a loop, instead of keeping a constant stick position, you tend to keep a constant <coughs> force on it. So what happens is as you climb into the loop, you pull, you pull, you pull, you pull, you pull, and what happens if you pull too much on the stick? Non-pilot people, what happens? The aircraft stalls. More than 16 degrees, the aircraft will stall. So what happens is you get about here and you stall. Which direction is the aircraft stalling? If I stall here, which direction the aircraft is trying to go? As far as the aircraft is concerned, the G-forces are that way. The aircraft is flying with all the weight going that way. If you stall, you stall that way. So you get here and the aircraft actually flip around. And then you get a very low speed with the aircraft not really flying, doing nothing. Like this. And then what you have to do is to dive a bit to get a, a bit of speed and go straight. And that's the, you know, it's easy to say, but the first time it happens, it's a bit weird. The other, the one is, if you do an aileron roll and you didn't get this attitude correct before starting, as you get under, the aircraft will be starting to dive to the ground. What is the instinct or the first reflex that you will have to get the aircraft out of this position? Pull up you will pull up, which means that you are pulling down already at the limit of the aircraft in terms of speed. If you pull down, you will actually hit the ground, or if you're very strong, you'll be able to you know, bring it back. Yeah, you will lose the aircraft. If you do an inverted loop, sorry, not an inverted loop, but a loop from the top, you usually start at a stall speed, very, very slow speed, because you will gain a lot of speed by the time you get at the bottom. If you do an aileron roll, you do it already at the speed, cruise speed of the aircraft. If you pull, you won't make it. First time it happened, they put you in an uh, inverted position. They say recover. You take the, the stick and you pull. The thing is, they know. Everybody does it. So they have actually put their hands like that and they are looking, waiting for it. So what is the way to get out of this? Anyone have an idea? Roll. Yeah, you just roll it back. And it's funny because I've done that for about a year and then uh, I've flown an aircraft that can fly inverted for the first time, so the instructor <coughs> put it inverted flight, so now you can fly it. I take the steering wheel back, <laughs> because the reflex to me when you got near the control was, well, the aircraft shouldn't be upside down, so I took it back. <laughs> so what are you doing? <laughs> I want to show you it flies inverted. So for each comment, for each maneuver, you learn how to do uh, understanding the maneuver. Stall turn is the most interesting maneuver that you will ever learn because there's all the flying properties that you know of an aircraft will apply in this maneuver. And it's quite an interesting one to be in, just that you have to make sure that your harnesses are well secure because you will be holding by your harnesses at one point. There's usually a five point, one that goes between the leg, the attache, and then you have the top one. The most important one is the one at the bottom. You have to make sure you're well attached, and there are no stall in the stall turn. It's only the name. Nobody understands why it's called a stall turn. The aircraft is not stalled. So what you do is you bring the aircraft in a vertical climb, 
and just when the aircraft is about to run out of speed, you kick the rudder so the aircraft cartwheel to about the pivot is about here, and then you do a dive until you reach a certain speed on the ground, and then you just pull out of it. Now, what's good with this maneuver is it allows you to do a 180 degree turn, and we talked of the stall turn just before, uh, not stall turn, the wing over. Wing over is just a big, big turn. The stall turn is really, you're coming down the way you went up. Now, the reason why this maneuver is very interesting, it's very easy to see when you see this. Why it's very interesting is, first of all, an aircraft that flies level produces lift. So if you bring the aircraft this way, what is it going to do? It's going to fly that way. So you have to find a point where the aircraft will climb level by being pointing to the top and they put repairs on the aircraft they put the rivet line is used for something and so the aircraft that have nothing they actually add uh, structures on it I mean, if you see on this this book on the top you can see at the wing tip there's some pieces of wires for the guy to see where the thing is now that's the first thing the other thing you need to know is when you fly an aircraft and then you climb the prop wash will create a yacht and you need to use you need to use a rudder to keep the aircraft straight. So as you climb you will use more and more rudder otherwise the aircraft will do that. By the time you get to the top you have full right rudder if it's a an aircraft that the prop turns this way like the one we have here. So the only way to turn is to the left. You kick the rudder to the left and as you do this what's happening this wing is not flying. The other one is so what happened is the aircraft wants to do this. So you actually have to control the aircraft to keep it this way. And now what's the next thing? This is a gyroscope. So you get gyroscope precedence because the aircraft is very slow. So if you tell the aircraft to do this, the aircraft will do this because of the gyroscope. <laughs> yeah, well you won't have probably the jet. So that's why it's a very interesting maneuver because there's a lot of things to do. Now, I'm going to demonstrate here what is involved in the aircraft. And to do this, I brought a stick with me. <laughs> so, you are sitting in the aircraft. Can you see a stick? Yeah? yeah? So, you are sitting in the aircraft. That's about the right position. And then what you do is, first of all, you get the speed, and then you, you climb to the vertical. So, you just pull on it. You get about 4 Gs and the aircraft start climbing. And don't forget that by the time I do this, I will be more like this. Oh. <laughs> and then as soon as you get the vertical climb, what you do is you put your stick back in the right position, and you look at the wing, and the wing is starting to fall on the horizon, so you put right rudder to keep it up. And then you watch your speed, 60, I'm okay, adjust the wing, and you, you play with this too, you have another repair on the wing tip that tells you if you're climbing correctly or not. Check the speed, and when you get a 38 knot, and don't miss it. When you get a 38 <laughs> knots, what you do is you kick the left rudder, boom! At the same time, the stick goes all the way to the right, all the way, like this, and at the same time, almost at the same time, you push. And ba basically it goes like this. You go up, right, 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 right and you get 38 left right push all the way and then the aircraft will that's my aircraft the aircraft will go down this way and then you just pull out of it why 38 why not before <coughs> For each well, aircraft. why not 48 or 28 or you know, why particularly 38? Well, is is that for that aircraft or is it for all aircraft? For this particular aircraft, for two, well, for most, it's a function, it, there's a calculation from the stall speed of the aircraft that gives you an average. And guys are, you know, you try 52, 50, 48. If you are too fast, you will just do this. Right. If you are too slow and daddy is coming back to them, he's sending, guess what? If you pass a 38, if you forgot. <laughs> What happened? Quick? Yeah. The aircraft will actually fly backwards. Bad news, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> and it's also called a tail slide. It is a recognized aerobatic maneuver. Most people who lend you the aircraft will not let you do it. 
Guess why? Because all the controls will go reverse. Very, very, very dangerous. So what happens is when you get into a third slide, what you have to do is two hands on the stick and an elbow here. You have to lock the stick. If ever the stick goes either way, you will actually snap the air on. So you have to hold it both sides. Why both sides is if you do this with the loading edge. When we learn this, they actually ask us, okay, hold your hand and then you move your hand. And if you take two hands, and if I do it, like put your two hands like this, your elbow on you, yeah, I can't move that. But just use one. So two hands. Now that's the first bit. The second bit that you have to do, and you have to take this, keep this uh, very neutral. The second thing you have to do is the two feet on the rudder very strongly. To make sure you hold the rudder. And now you know you've missed the point. So you get 40. Oh, shit, I missed it. Then you hold it, and, oh, no, no, what's happening? and then you go down backward, and then depending if the stick is a little bit forward or a little bit backward, you will either fall, if you, you will either fall on the front like this, which is not too bad, or you will fall on the back. That is not good. Because you get, when it, when it falls, it actually falls really strongly, and then you get all the pressure on your shoulder, and and you can only do two or three in one salty. So, have, have you done that, Luke? Yeah, two or three times. Have you ever done it normal? Well, yeah. I've done it two when I was done. learning this because there's so many things. Yeah, you know, it looks like too bad yeah, I don't have the video to show you. But well, I have the video, but I don't want to put it back. When it happens, it happens very quickly. This climb and check the rudder and it is the wing level or something. Check your speed. I'm at 60. I'm still okay in the blue. Oh no, I missed it, and then you start going back. So it's uh, you have to do do it a couple of times. But if you keep doing this with an aircraft, then uh, the aircraft won't last too long. <coughs> Slow roll, very difficult. Look easy. You see an aircraft, it just goes around like this. Why is it very difficult? Because as you do the slow roll, you will do a oh, they put it there. A bread knife. As you do the slow roll, the aircraft will be in a position where you use the rudder as elevator to keep the aircraft flying. When you, then you get into inverted flight, and then you go back to the other side, and you have to use the rudder to keep the aircraft up, and then you get this way. The problem with this is all that has to be coordinated. So guys like me, when they do slow rolls, more like, you know, it's, it's not very well. But if you see a movie where someone is really good at it, you'll see it's very, very fluid. That of the eight point roll. Yeah, and then after that they do it, this guy's doing a 16 point on the commander. What they do is they kick it a bit. Mm -hmm. This is also, well, this is even more difficult. And actually stop at each position. Yeah, that's each position. <laughs> You've got to stay there for a couple of seconds. Roll over the top is uh, you do a loop, and by the time you get to the top, you go back here, and then you fly the other way. Uh, falling leaf, very, very nice to see from outside, very, very uncomfortable. What you do is you take the aircraft and you slow it down to the stall speed, ready to spin, and then you kick the rudder to spin it, but as soon as it wants to turn into the spin, you kick the other rudder, so the aircraft comes down like this. <laughs> the reason why it's not very comfortable inside, as you would imagine, is that you're just flying sideways, like you have almost no forward speed, and then the aircraft is just going from one side to another one. Cuban loop, uh, the other one where there's a component of the loop that is straight and you finish with a round. And there's about eight ways of putting it, plus you can do it erect or inverted. Spin, this is not a maneuver, so that bat out is when you, when you can't <coughs> handle it, and you shoot. I Check first if you have something in your back. The spin is quite a, an interesting maneuver, and until I think the late 30s, they knew about the spin, but nobody could get out of it. And the reason why nobody could get out of it is, well, what happened with spin is you start in one wing fall, and the aircraft start going down like a chopper prop, but it's just not producing enough lift. You go down 6,000 feet a minute, when we do that, we do it for 20 seconds. We start at 6,000 feet, 20 seconds, and we got to get out 4,000. If you don't get out, you get to the ground in another 40 seconds. And when you do the spin, the problem is when you recover, which is only to use a rudder, 
on the opposite direction, it takes two or three turns to get out of it. So the people who were falling into a spin used to try all sorts of things. But you know, you try it for two seconds, doesn't work, another three seconds, another thing. So nobody really, well, it took a long time before someone actually knew how, or find out how to get out of it. And the day the guy find out, he went back into an aircraft and they did two or four times. <coughs> and everybody is doing it today as, because we know how to get out of it. Why does it take that length of time to get out? Because there's not much air moving over the road. Well, yeah, all the controls are sluggish. Yeah. Uh, you don't have airspeed, very low airspeed. And in fact, we heard a story when we went to Wollongong the other day, a guy years ago actually got into the clouds and he knew he was in the mountain area and he did a spin to land in the trees. He said, because this is a lower speed an aircraft will go, and it will fall like this in the trees, he said, I'll be better off than just crashing that way. And yeah, the guy surviving the aircraft wasn't that damaged. <laughs> but, I mean, it was a target mark. That flies, that stalls about 40 knots or 30 knots. So, you see, that won't be done with a 7 for 7. The other thing, the other thing quite interesting is people used to bat out of speed before they knew how to get it. So people used to fly with a shoot. Ah, no, I mean spin, that up, open the canopy, whatever, jump out, and the aircraft used to recover by itself. <laughs> and then they used to see the aircraft just say, <laughs> <laughs> So someone one day thought, next time I'm going to spin, I will just do nothing. And that will actually, in most cases, recover. Okay, right. it's just that it takes longer to recover. So mm -hmm. if you don't have the, the ground, or if you don't have the height, then it might not. We might not make it on time. Any question on this before I pass the next thing? The captain? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's before or after uh, that you need an ambulance, but uh, I'll talk about some uh, people consideration. The first thing you have to remember is that we will go through plus and minus G's. Minus G's. And it is not something you can do on the ground. You can't really practice. It's only in aircraft or special <coughs> aerospatial equipment that they have. And it's something that you have to learn with. My tolerance in G's is much better now than when I started. And when I bring someone in, I have to remember, uh, you will get uh, a tunnel, tunnel vision. Your vision will actually go down. It's not dangerous. As soon as you stop the G's, it comes back or you will have a blackout. It's not dangerous too, because as soon as the G stops, you're back. <laughs> well, the reason I'm saying that is there are people that went into a blackout, so the aircraft was in too many G when they recovered. They've actually blacked out, lost conscience, and when they woke up, the aircraft was flying. And then they just took back the control and said, well, I think that's enough for today. <laughs> 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 the other thing too is uh, if you go into military aircraft where they're going to pull a lot of Gs, they actually wear G suits. Don't get on. It's not the same thing as a G string. A G suit actually <laughs> fits your whole body, and they actually put pressure, air pressure in it. And when you pull some Gs, they blow up the suit so that it avoid or stop the blood rushing down your legs. It keep the blood weight where it's required. And the other thing too is they say that if you go from minus G to plus G right after a maneuver, then you're going to black out there's some limits of tolerance that you have to respect to get the blood flowing back to where it's needs to be. Size. They say size don't matter, but in aerobatics it does a bit. Because if you're not tall enough, or if you're not strong enough, you might not be able to Tall enough, you might not be able to push a rudder all the way to the end to get you out of the spin. And if you're not strong enough and you get into a spiral and you have to pull out, it's really hard to pull out. Where we all else in life, if you are fitter, it's usually easier to do. Uh, you have more tolerance, but it's not uh, that critical. And just a bit more, I wanted to leave you with a little souvenir, so I'll have a handout to, for you. How much does it cost? Uh, to get a license that will allow you to bring some people in the training area and do some aerobatics will cost you between six and eight thousand dollars will probably take you a year if you do it weekend. Uh, that won't give you a navigation license, but it will allow you to do all sorts of fun things. Is it expensive? Don't know. It's about the price of an overseas holiday for five weeks, but you spend a year every weekend to work on that. And if you go somewhere, if you travel, when you come back, it's a souvenir that you get. If you fly, then you can do it again and again and again. 
Where do we do it? Usually outside control is based on this you have experience. Not above build up area, usually above 3,000 feet. So depending on the uh, restricted area and all that, you have to select where you, uh, how to do it or where to do it. You don't do it by instrument. Most of the instruments are useless in aerobatic flights. They sort of lose where the horizon is or the direction is. And uh, you don't do it at night. And all that, obviously, is if you have a special clearance, you could do it. But who would want to do aerobatic in the IFR? Nobody can see you with the <laughs> Competition, that's usually why people do aerobatics. I mean, the next step for me would be to go in competition. I'm not really interested, I wanted the skill. And when they do competition, they do what you saw as maneuvers, one after the other one, they don't stop. And they do it for a few hours, or oh, sorry, a few minutes. It usually lasts 20 minutes for a competition per person. And they have an area that they decide, which is about the length of a runway. It's three, 500 feet above the runway, up to 3,000 and a half, or 3,500 feet. And that gives a box, and they have to do all the aerobatics maneuver in the box. And what people do at home, they use a very, a much smaller aircraft than that, it's about this size. They actually draw on the floor, and they make a box at home, and they actually build the sequences. And how do they remember? is they have a language or a way to script that, which is called <coughs> RST, if you can just put that around. It first started with ribbon. The people used to do like, it looks like a toilet paper roll, and people used to draw ribbon, which is very <coughs> complex. And Mr. RST actually defined a language or a way to script the aerobatic maneuvers, and the way it's done is, if it doesn't make sense to start a maneuver after the end of another one, you won't be able to match them together. Don't forget, you always have to convert your kinetic energy and potential energy and vice versa. You cannot start a maneuver at very high speed if it requires a low speed. So this language will actually allow that. And where it's dotted line on these diagrams, it means that you're flying inverted. Where they're straight line, it means that they are, you're flying on an erect position. What's an example of where, where you actually do this? We usually do it at Badger is great. Oh. So <laughs> I'm going to match against the airport uh, <laughs> for other purpose or other reason. But that if you uh, you can get a lower level clearance, a lot of people do it at Naira Bean as well, but you can only go up to 2,000 feet there. So people do it in that 500 feet window. We're above the no, no, and above the beach, I mean, on the, in the ocean side. Now, if you want to know more, if I give you the taste of trying it or doing it, I have it from the flying school where I go, two leaflets that explain to you what you need to do if some people are interested. But also I have business cards from them, because if you are interested in flying aerobatics, and if you would like to do it, you should do it with a professional. I fly aerobatics at that, I will clock about 15 hours a year. They clock about 20 hours a week. These guys do that for living. They do it every day. So if you want to do it, you go with a professional. So you can grab the car. You will have the choice between a biplane, which is you will see very often on Northern Beaches, Red Bar and Tour. With, that's very fun. You're outside. But the only part that they won't let you the stick. They actually remove the stick from your cockpit. Or you can do it with the aircraft you saw there, or a robin. And with these aircraft, you'll be sitting, it's a side-by-side. -side. The instructor will actually give you the stick and help you go through the maneuvers and all that. It's a lot of fun. And for $200, you'll get about an hour, I'd say 50 minutes, I think. Now, they know me very well, so if you tell them I sent you, you will get a 10% surcharge for all the damage I've done there. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful, don't tell them that I sent you. <laughs> okay, so what we've seen tonight is that aerobatics went from a necessity to a pleasure. We've <coughs> seen the ropes and loaves. We've seen that we need a, usually a stronger aircraft to do aerobatics. That maneuvers, uh, that we build maneuvers usually by combining basic maneuvers. And then there are human limits that uh, we have to respect. And the message I want to leave tonight is aerobatics. That's where the sky is no longer a limit. Thank you. <laughs>